Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we're going to begin the keynote portion of the luncheon program. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence, U.S. Army retired, President and Chief Executive Officer of AFSIA International. Thank you, and if you haven't finished your lunch, please uh, go ahead and enjoy uh, that great meal. Uh, thank you to the facilities here. And um, I want to uh, talk about what an amazing start we've had to this conference, starting with Admiral Khan, and then our keynote speaker, Admiral Harry Harris, and um, just finished up a distinguished panel with that covered so many key topics that we're facing today, and the topic was, are our warfighting communities enough to meet the new warfighting challenges? So again, a great, great start to our conference. We are pleased to recognize GTIT as the sponsor of today's lunch. At this time, I would like to invite Michelle Englehart, the Defense Growth Vice President, to the stage to introduce the facilitator for this afternoon's discussion. Michelle? Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again at West 2022. I'm thrilled to be here in person. I'm Michelle Engelhart, Defense Growth Vice President for General Dynamics Information Technology. Before we start today's keynote, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our conference hosts, FCA International and the U.S. Naval Institute. None of this could have happened today without their dedicated efforts. Their work has brought together critical forums like this one, where we can hear directly from the sea service budget leads. As we look ahead as a community, insights into how the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard are faring in the current budget environment, particularly as it relates to operating under a continuing resolution, are vital to determining how we can meet future budgetary challenges. There is no better person to lead this discussion than the moderator of our lunch and keynote discussion today, retired Vice Admiral Joe Malloy. Admiral Malloy is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and has an MBA from the Harvard Graduate School of Business. Operationally, he is a career submariner. Ashore, he held assignments at OpNav and on the joint staff with tours in plans, policy, programming, budget, and analysis. In his last assignment on active duty, Admiral Malloy spent four years as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations, Integration of Capabilities and Resources at N8. He participated in several past West conferences as a speaker in his capacity as the N8, and we are honored to have him back with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice Admiral Joe Malloy, and I ask General Christopher Mahoney, Admiral John Gumbleton, and Admiral, Admiral Mark Fedor to join us as well. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It should be a great Thank day. You, Come on. <clears throat> nice job. You're welcome. All right. <clears throat> All right, we can see uh, right. we're joined by by Chris and Gumby. <clears throat> How are you guys doing today? The uh, budget battles continue, <clears throat> so I am honored to be here, and thank you very much for AFSIA West, Admiral Daly, an old friend, GDIT for sponsoring this event. And I've, uh, I'm, I'm filling in, but I'm, I'm happy to be here, as I've got many times been out in AFSIA West, and I found it to be an important uh, organization to drive technology forward, <clears throat> and as our military has gotten more complex, the ability to have the technology at our fingertips has been really important. And we've all seen that in the last two years is we're much more connected and we have to keep going that. So this is, a, I, I, I really respect these three gentlemen. I've known some of them just a little while, others for a long time because they're in the trenches of the battle and they have to keep the wheels on the bus and take care of sailors, coast guards, and marinesmen every day, no matter what's happening 
in D.C. or around the world, someone has to operate, someone has to be fed, someone has to buy a part, someone has to move something, and it all requires the resources to do it, and these three, these three men do that. They're also agile. They can be here talking to us remote and dealing with right now, trying to balance that they uh, combine sets of budgets here of over approaching 200 billion a year for the next five years. I'm not sure they can tell us a lot about it, but that's some big numbers when you have a fit up and you're talking about a trillion dollars, they now have to process in eight days, make it stick together, and be able to get to the Hill and defend it all. It's an amazing attribute to all of them. And I, uh, I first want to say thank you to the service budget yeah. officers. <clears throat> so now, I hope they'll reveal a little bit, but they probably won't here. <laughs> But I want to start with a question for each one of them. What are your priorities for FY22 and 23 and beyond, assuming there's a fit up? And what are your most important procurement programs? So I'll start with, with Chris as a senior man here. Hey, hey thanks, Admiral Malloy, and good to see you. Uh, don't thank us yet. Uh, we need to get the budget across and get it approved. Uh, so a long, long way to go, but I'll take it in advance. Um, to your question about priorities, for the Marine Corps, it, it's been a, a campaign of palms, uh, if you will, uh, starting when Commandant uh, Berger came uh, into the Commandancy. And, and our theme has kind of been, hey, we're going to fund our the force design changes uh, first internally. And so we've had to figure out what we need less going forward and what we need more of to uh, <laughs> rig for the future fight. And we've had some pretty good uh, success with that over the last three palms. I think in, in 23 going forward, uh, we'll work through it. And right now was pretty decisional. I think that the momentum that we've had in getting rid of the things that we don't need as much for the future fight and investing in the things that we do uh, will be successful uh, going forward. But again, we look at it as a collection of budget years, if you will, or a collection of palms in order to put the whole plan together to be ready for the future fight while balancing that, as you say, with, with the current requirements to take care of Marines and sailors. Okay. Thank you. Admiral Gumbleton? Hey, sir. Great to see you and, uh, and uh, Admiral Fedor again here. Uh, so with respect to uh, priorities, uh, first tactically, uh, we're in a unique spot right now. I had hoped to be there with you on, on stage, but as I was walking out of the Pentagon, the tracker bracelet on my ankle activated and it wouldn't let me out of the <laughs> but, uh, uh, Quite literally, we're answering 22 conference questions right now, at the same time trying to come to budget lock with OSD here, uh, literally at the same time. So tactically a very challenging time. But I think uh, when you open the uh, the aperture or widen it, I should say, uh, in terms of priorities uh, for your Navy has been very consistent. Uh, Columbia, uh, number one. And then from Columbia, of course, we move on to uh, our priorities are the uh, you know readiness to fight tonight. Uh, we need to improve our capabilities so we can compete uh, technologically with our you know rising powers and our, our peer adversaries. And then also we have to worry about our capacity. We have to, uh, we have a, a Chinese fleet that is not getting smaller uh, anytime soon. So when you think of your priorities as the three naval services come together, we, uh, you know, clearly we have a, a strong uh, sense of urgency because of uh, uh, speaking about that growing fleet. But I think, you know, uh, clearly Columbia readiness to fight today, capabilities and capacity is, has been our uh, watchword here for a couple years running now. Here, I was able to egress out of D.C. for a few days, and my shipmates are, are back there fighting the budget battles. But uh, it, it's great to be here. And in terms of uh, overall priorities, it really comes down to one word. It's readiness. Um, our commandant, when he came in in 2018, focused on readiness. And just to give you a snapshot of what that means for us, going back to about 2010, we had pretty much stagnating budgets. We, we weren't really growing. We were executing operationally uh, as high as we ever did but the budget was not keeping pace. And every year we were losing about 500 plus days of cutter deployment days, about 22 aircraft worth of days were just off the table due to, due to under, unplanned maintenance. And on the shore side, we racked up about a 3.5 billion shore backlog. And every mission starts and begins at a base. So we had to get after that. 
The other readiness things, it comes to our workforce. We sacrificed, we continued operating, but we sacrificed in terms of training, um, in terms of IT, and all the things that go with recruiting a diverse workforce. We sacrificed a lot of that. And so readiness is absolutely the number one concern. And we, we're still, it's been a little better these last few years, but that is still our number one watchword. Okay, thank you. Well, I remember specifically, and learning this from, from Pete down on DDRA and the Joint Staff, is proper funding allows smooth support of the combatant commanders and mm -hmm. missions around the world, and the Navy has always been a tremendous supporting force, working with our brothers in, in green with the Marine Corps and with the Coast Guard. So I guess I want to start with a few more. What can you tell us about the Coast Guard augmenting the Navy fleet around the world right now, mm -hmm. and what specifics of those supports are the most important, and how does the Commandant prioritize your Coast Guard missions? Yeah. That, that's, that's a great question. It, right now, the Coast Guard has 11 statutory missions, and there's lots of uh, folks on the Hill that want to make sure we're doing each and every one of those to the level they think it should be. Um, if you saw the Indo-PACOM uh, strategy that came out in the fact sheet, it called out the Coast Guard pretty specifically to do more. And uh, I always use the acronym with my folks. If you remember that Saturday Night Live skit with Will Ferrell, talks about more cowbell. Yeah. There's a whole lot of demand for more cowbell. Uh, for the Coast Guard out there. And so we're trying to respond to that and balance um, how we do all of our domestic missions as well as deploy uh, overseas. And we've been doing that for years. We're no stranger to the Pacific. We're no stranger uh, to the Med in different areas. But now it's doing it in terms of working uh, with our Navy and Marine Corps brethren. How do we stay interoperable um, to do that? Some of our higher end ships, the National Security Cutters, are very well equipped to do that. We're building an offshore patrol cutter, a fleet of 25 ships that will have similar capabilities. But where does that funding come from? You know, the, the Coast Guard sits within the Department of Homeland Security. There's a lot of political pressure there and polarization around DHS. Um, so how do we work that Navy-type, Navy-owned funding with our, with our brethren in the Navy? How does that come over? And, and sometimes working across those jurisdictions is akin to the, the DMZ up on the Hill. People don't want to mix, mix, mix budgets. But as we deal with these complex, I heard the term wicked problems earlier, we might have to start thinking differently about how we do that. Okay. Um, but we're Thank committed you. to the mission. Hey, thanks a lot. General Mahoney, so what, what highlight can you pass on us about changes in operations with the Navy, especially as you're entering your third cycle with, with the Commodore Burgers changes in the Marine Corps and being able to adjust to do less in some areas and more? And the one highlight just that caught my eye being a, being a submariner from the Pacific was anti-submarine warfare seems to be coming up as kind of a, it may be on the margin, but the Marines are throwing themselves at that. So what can you tell us about what the Commandant's given you as the direction to think about working with the Navy and working with the Coast Guard and being engaged to the combatant commanders? Hey, thanks, and I think the Commandant uh, has been pretty clear about returning to the naval roots as the way uh, one of the mechanisms to get us prepared for the future fight. Uh, the Navy, of course, has DMO. Within that, some of the supporting structure is uh, expeditionary advanced based ops and littoral ops in a contested environment. When you put that whole picture together, it, uh, it describes a distributed naval force that brings the sensors, the weapons, and the effects to bear at the time and place uh, where they're needed. In order to do that, uh, you have to be mobile, you have to be able to maneuver, and you got to sustain that. So as we build things within force design, like the Marine Littoral Regiment, as we bolster things like uh, the Marine Expeditionary Units, um, we have concomitant requirements for that mobility, for that maneuver, uh, and for sustainment, which goes back to um, amphibious shipping. Traditional L-class ships, uh, the ships that support the L-class ships and the light amphibious warship, if people have uh, heard of that, which to me is has operational reach and closes that last tactical mile of mobility, once again, maneuver and sustainment. Um, we, we get very nervous when we see budgetary constraints that force the Navy into, into decisions with the SCN account that brings those amphibious ships down or moves uh, bringing new hull types like the law into, into the fitter. So uh, the componency of distributed maritime ops, I think we feed into that with those two subcomponents of EABO and Loki. And then there are enablers and things that we require to be supported by resources from another Title X um, service chief in order to be able to bring that to fruition.
So Admiral Gumbleton, you're an aviator, so is the general. One item I've certainly seen is that a focus of yours, Admiral Kreitz, and really Admiral Lesher was readiness in naval aviation really enables a tremendous part around the world. What can you tell us about what has been able to make naval aviation get ready and really raise that up over the last couple of years despite three years of CRs and now one that's going for five months? How did, you, how did you work with Admiral Lesher and the fleets to drive in the right direction? And what are the lessons for the, the bigger Navy around readiness accounts in terms of naval aviation and readiness? Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. But before I do, let me piggyback on something the general just mentioned, which is the pressurization within the ship construction account. Is, you know, just in our 22 submit, <clears throat> Columbia class was roughly 26% of our, our account and, and that didn't buy, that was incremental funding. That wasn't actually buying a hull, that was just for an increment of Columbia. And so that really speaks to that fact alone, uh, speaks to uh, you know, the pressure when it comes to the macro account, when you're looking at, you know, uh, we're gonna go to serial production in Columbia here in a few years, Virginia class trying to maintain the industrial base at two per year destroyers, et cetera. So not a small challenge indeed uh, when and we want to you know make sure the industrial base can maintain and keep up uh, and then you want to add in <clears throat> you know we got to maintain amphibious shipping and then we want to introduce law no small challenge and a very pressurized account so that i think that just uh, bears repeating mm -hmm. uh, now going back to uh, aviation readiness i think uh, you know I think a lot of this is uh, with uh, Vice Chief Lesher's view of, uh, you know, let's, let's get real and get better. And getting real was uh, uh, honest and hard look at our, our own behaviors and our own performance. And so when you look at uh, a snapshot in time of 2018 into now, where roughly we had about a population of 250 odd Super Hornets up at any given time, um, and now we're maintaining roughly 340 and the new goal of getting up to 360 Super Hornets up at any given time. That wasn't because we took a dump truck of cash and dumped it on to our friends in Naval Aviation. Uh, half of that was process change, looking at how are we doing our depot level and intermediate level maintenance and, uh, and updating those, uh, those maintenance decks, et cetera, and where can we squeeze in efficiency into those processes. Uh, now, th there were some modest investments in, in parts and in, in training in our people, so it, it certainly wasn't a, a free mm -hmm. thing altogether, but the macro point of it was looking at how we do our business and process improvement led to that change. Uh, we have another initiative now with Naval Aviation is uh, how can we reduce the cost of how we operate our fleet? And we want to take that to scale, not just within aviation, but they're leading to say, okay, hey, you, got, you improved your readiness. Uh, now we're looking at our friends in the submarine community and the, the ship community say, okay, uh, we'd like to see the same changes with you. No, by the way, our aviation brothers and sisters are going to try to reduce costs there. The same thing is coming to you. And so it's, uh, I think it's all about uh, get real, get better, and looking at our process improvement. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I think there's an awful lot to, to say about whether the services have their own view on, in your case, readiness accounts too. You had to go back and go back to basics on fuel and flying, right? Right. In the Coast Guard? We certainly did. I think I think that's a great point um, Admiral Gumbleton made about just processes. You know, if I've learned anything in, in this job over the past two years, it's you're never going to have enough money, never, mm -hmm. um, no matter how much it may rain on you. So you need to really look inside your own lifelines and how can you be more efficient. And there's certainly some process improvements. There's even maybe some some policy things, whether it's a legislative change proposal or something else, you can you can leverage to be more efficient inside your right. own lifelines. And and we become pretty efficient at trying to squeeze kind of every penny, wring every penny out of every dollar that we have, and, and we'll just have to keep doing that. I understand. But that brings up a good point. General Mahoney and I were talking last week. This the uh, the NDA requirement to go back and do a PPV study, General. I just saw yesterday Jamie Moran, who was the, Morin, who was the head of Cape when I was in the Pentagon for many years, has just been named to it too. What are your thoughts on that panel? I'll go to each of you. But you and I were talking about it on Friday, General. What's your thoughts on that and service appointments? But what can we really expect from this PPBE reform that should apply to everything we're talking about here? 
when, when you see names come across like Jamie Moran and Ellen Lord, you know that you know that they're they're serious. And, and and Mr. Hale, uh, there's probably no better uh, cast of professionals to undertake this task. The the down and in task to look at planning, to look at programming, budgeting, and execution absolutely needs to be done. Uh, not only to economize in, in resources, but to tighten the timeline of how quick we turn from turning a dream into a requirement into something that we can execute. So in general terms, uh, Section 1004 there of the NDAA, I think is absolutely required. I'll, I'll just make one point. That's kind of down and in to the apart, uh, into the department. Uh, Admiral Gumbleton and I were talking previous to this about the last 10 years, uh, producing nine CRs, one enacted budget in the last 10 years. So I think as much as we look down and in, we need to look up and out at the process that produces a 900 batting average for CRs. So there's something to be looked at, I think, on the legislative side. I mean, I take those odds to Vegas any day uh, for a CR. So I think there's a two-way street here in order to go end-to-end -end and and quicken the pace, which I think is what everybody's been talking about today. Well, I appreciate that. In fact, I asked Admiral Gumbleton, as we talked also about CRs, and I see it now retired on the other side. When I was there, it was like, get the money out, keep going, but you only have so many months to execute. And I also know, having been FMB, somewhere in another couple of weeks, you'll be putting out a memo for mid-year reviews, send everything into FMB too, and we're gonna line up to get execution haircuts on every rdt and &E account, by, by May 15th, otherwise OSD will take it. So I feel for all of you, but what else have you seen be able to get ready, get things done with CRs, and I now see it on the other side, is it really is remarkably disruptive to the whole industrial base to keep things going and starting and stopping. So from your point of view, what have you been able to do to try to keep this going, or what would be your message about continuing resolutions, and hopefully we don't have a year-long one this year? Yeah, thanks, sir. Uh, a a year-long CR would be uh, catastrophic is, is not too strong a term to use. It, it truly would be uh, within our personnel accounts and uh, would be a bill. We wouldn't, would be challenged to make payroll. We would have to not assess people, et cetera. Although I'm, I'm positive signals from the Hill with respect to, you know, coming to conference. So, uh, you know, that's certainly a, a positive step in the right direction. And our messaging to our fleets, et cetera, is spend the money like you have it because we've been here before, right? Nine mm -hmm. out of the last 10 years. So, so we don't self-regulate or self-govern early, except to the limit where we only have 21 value in, in money. Mm -hmm. So a question about, well, how do you manage is, uh, you know, here we are in month five. And so we have uh, learned to be, uh, good at bad behavior, right? We've, we've spent the last decade of deferring contracts to Q2. Um, and now we're, we're actually, a, we are adjusting and evolving to say, actually, let's, let's move these to Q3 now. And here I am in month five, I'm going, I've got a Tomahawk contract, a DLE five contract or another weapons contract. Can I sweep up every WPN dollar Mm -hmm. in this CR period and at least award one of them here in the, you know, the sixth month of Q2. Um, that's not a great way uh, to support or be a partner of our industrial base. And when you consider that we probably, you probably did that uh, several years ago means uh, multiple years of simply swinging behind the pitch. So that articulates the challenge. And then potentially to piggyback on what the general just said is, is PPBE reform the opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are we not only gonna look down and in, but up and out and partner with our friends on the Hill? Uh, because I think at the end of the day, everybody wants to do the right thing. Um, and so that's our opportunity. And I hope we, uh, we grasp that because okay. we need I agree. I think it's a great opportunity. And there are some pretty remarkable people named the panel that hopefully will get traction. Yeah. Now, is the Homeland Security and Coast Guard going to get a, a member of that, too? Because you really kind of draw in our world as well as your world. Right. We are. I'm not sure if there is anyone there, but we are certainly watching that. I was aware of it and impressed by the names that were part of that. So we run our own internal PBB&E cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing we've tried to do is I, I kind of grew up in, in the budget development world, and we're very good at the 
current year out to three year budget build. I call it a knife fight inside DC. That's what it is. And you gotta be able to live and fight in that area. But we started getting a little bit better at looking at that three year mark out to the 20 year mark. And we just stood up our own PAE office and it falls under my, my auspices as the eight. And that's gonna help us kind of look at those, those wicked problems that we know we're going to face. Whether it's how we're transitioning to an all MH60 helicopter fleet. How do we do that? Where are they? Do we have the hangar space? All those kind of questions. And then how do you wrap that into the pbb and &E cycle so that you're doing that mythical goal of putting strategy ahead of the budget? That's where we're trying to go. Um, the other thing we've adjusted is the global force management process. We usually operated on a year-long cycle where we would commit to the Navy assets. And, and that was too, too, too slow for them. They, they, they're planning deployments too far out. So we increased it to a two-year cycle. So as we look at Indo-PACOM and that theater, we can commit resources a little bit ahead of time, whether it's a cutter, whether it's a mobile training team, anything else that may be needed, and kind of get it into that process so that we could budget for it, and it's also scheduled. We can make sure the maintenance is ready for that cutter, the training, and get that, get that ship out in, term, in time with an ESG or whatever they're deploying with. So okay. Lots of challenges. Right. I'd like to shift gears a little bit because I think this group would be interested. Admiral Harris this morning brought up is at the knife edge the world's on right now and the cyber events happening between Russia clearly can lean in and China is and I think everyone in the room who works in a company knows you've either been cyber attacked or you've been and you just don't even know it. And I think yeah. the thousands of tests we have going on. So from your viewpoint, I'll start with General Mahoney. What investments are you guys making in cyber? How are you doing those operations? How are you integrating in that's somewhat unique to the Marine Corps, but it's also part of a global force that has to be the cyber threats, how do we deal with what authorities? And I was gonna really cycle through because the Coast Guard brings some other Title 14 authorities. Mm -hmm. But you know, you and I talked Friday a little bit about cyber is really important, but how do you try to get ahead of that and support it as a budget, yet it's changing so rapidly? Yeah, you know, uh, I think Lieutenant General Glavy uh, is gonna be on your panel uh, a little bit later and he can get down to the aegis, but I'll tell you, that as a portion of the planning of how we get after force design, uh, network uh, modernization and the cyber elements of network modernization figure very prominently in, in the amount of resource that, uh, that goes toward that. If you look at some of the other elements of force design and equipment mod uh, modernization from TPS-80 to uh, network on the move to other sensing uh, initiatives that we have, cyber either in a defensive sense or in another sense, offensively is built into some, if not all of these uh, systems. And that goes to our airborne systems, the MQ-9, F-35 as well. So uh, it, it's knowing that it is maybe the first move and the best move, uh, the portion of resources going to it is only increasing. Okay. Is General or Admiral Gumbleton, I ask you also to let you know, General Admiral Trussler is about 25 feet away here at the head table here. So I'm certain he's taking some notes about how you'll discuss his world and how well you'll finance him. I, I found my life when I was budget officer. Everyone was hanging on to every word and I better be careful what I say. So just to let you know, he's far away and he's got his pen out. Well, uh, thanks for that. I'm pretty sure he owes me a few offsets today. So I'll be able to reach out to him. Um, I think it speaks to the challenge of uh, the PPPE reform and how quickly we can react and how agile are we within a two year cycle. And we're looking for some authorities that Hill granted us is to you know, manage a, uh, an IT program that touches into cyber within a R&D. So previously, we would uh, manage an account with O&M, OPN and R&D. So three different appropriations uh, to do one effect. And so we've been given some authorities to move that into R&D. So we have multi-year money and try to move faster. Uh, but that's just at, at the scale of it. So we do have challenges with flexibility and appropriation and time delay. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thanks. So Admiral, you and I were talking about some Coast Guard because right. then the DOD lives in article in, in Title oh, 10 right. and Title 50. And mm -hmm. we talked Title 60 ops. I learned yeah. from General Luck on being a submariner and. Yeah. Special Forces, my son's right. in, is that's the famous Title 60 Ops, but you're, we're talking to you, was it, was your 64 Ops with, or 54, right? 50. Yeah, because uh, you have yeah. 50 and 14. 15, so what's right. unique you bring yeah. to the cyber world as well yeah. as your operations? Yeah, so I, I, we are, we are investing pretty heavily in cyber. In fact, we, uh, our, 
created a cyber major at the Coast Guard Academy. Those, those men and women will graduate this spring, will be the first cyber majors to come out in the fleet. So a couple, two, priority, two major priorities there is the first one is protecting our own network. You know, we live in the dot mill and the dot gov environment, which makes it very challenging for our, uh, our Pentagon brothers and sisters. You know, how do we manage that? How do we work across that? Um, and the second one is protecting the marine transportation system. That, without a doubt, keeps a lot of us up, up at night because you think about the value of the marine transportation system, 5.6 trillion worth of economic activity going in and out of our ports. Most folks don't know that cell phone in your pocket on the table here probably came in on a ship, or at least the components came in on a ship, and maybe it was put together here in the United States. That is critical, not just to our economic lifeblood, it is the economic lifeblood of all those goods coming in there, but I think as a nation, since World War II, we just assumed we could project power from the ports and get that military power wherever we wanted to go, and it was not a problem. That, that has changed. We're all thinking a little differently that we better make sure the ports are secure and that we can get out and project power where we need to. So we are investing a, a lot in those, those cyber protection teams, even a cyber mission team that could potentially reach out and touch someone in that world. But at the tactical level in the ports, we have some cyber specialists that are out there in our what we call our sectors, the captains of the port. Um, we're also a regulator. So we have relationships with the maritime industry and we're trying to forge that relationship in the cyber realm because you know, if, if you are a major shipping company, you probably don't want to reveal that you've been hacked in cyber because that might hurt your, uh, your bottom line business. So we try to be a trusted common sense regulator where we can at least share that information help them secure their networks um, so they could prevent those catastrophic incidents from happening, and then use that information as we look back to the Department of Homeland Security as well as you know, over to DOD and how do we make our infrastructure secure from a cyber uh, vulnerability standpoint. That is a huge challenge, and I know it keeps uh, our commandant awake up at night, and I'm sure a lot of other folks as well. Okay, thanks. I think I have about three or four minutes before I go to questions to the audience, but I got one last one for, for all of you. And really, it's this tough top lines. Even if the pass back comes with some extra money, as, as Pete and others talked about, there's never enough money. I mean, I've never, ever seen, no matter a plus up ever happened, that it wasn't all spoken for and someone's losing a toy somewhere. And in fact, Admiral Khan opened with that this morning, talking about tough choices the Navy's making from his viewpoint. But really, talking to the, the general first, and I'll go around the room here, is what budget strategies have you brought so far to be able to balance 23 and what, even if you have a plus now, not everything you want there, and as you support your service secretary and your service chief, are you looking at skimming programs or are you making, you know, the classic haircut or are you actually looking at, you know, thinning items or vertical cuts? And Admiral Khan talked about that today, but he didn't have any specifics and maybe you can't have Admiral Gumbleton in your turn, but that's still important is what is the strategy each one of you had as you tried to balance right now going into 23 and obviously you're both, I know all three are working 24 right now because that's living the dream in the Pentagon. So General? Sir, we got a, we got a 22, 23, 24 sandwich going on uh, right now. <laughs> I'm not sure how any of it's gonna taste. But as far as strategy goes, you know, I go back to the, the campaign of Palms. We look, we, we look at it through a lens of multiple years and are we making progress? What is the pace of that progress? And what are the adjustments to be made as we go through submitting a new Palm and of course the budget year? Um, when you break force design down, it's, it's generally three main components. It's equipment modernization, it's talent management, and, and it's 21st century training. Now, kind of in that order is our strategy for health. Uh, we have pulled a lot out of structure. We have folded flags. We have brought the end strength of the Marine Corps down uh, significantly in order to build the resources against those. So, but if you th hold those three up, uh, we probably equipment readiness leads the way, followed shortly thereafter by talent management, the costs associated with maturing a force, with changing the grade plating, with taking new ways to uh, recruit and retain, and then adjusting the training. Uh, your previous uh, panel had a great discussion on it uh, to make sure that we have uh, the Marines and sailors that, that can man that equipment and put it into battery when the time comes. Thanks a lot, General Admiral Gumbleton. Yeah, yes, sir. It's a, it's going to be a tasty sandwich. The general mentioned, so I'm looking forward to that. 
<laughs> at the end of the day, it's, it's all about strategy and valuation. And so uh, we'll stay true to the strategy, which is, you know, uh, Columbia first strategic deterrent, you know, for the, for the you know, survival of the nation state. And then it's about, you know, <clears throat> capability, ready to fight tonight. So the readiness piece, investing in those uh, capabilities that so we can keep up with our near peer or strategic rival mm -hmm. China and so we have to invest in that and then you know our capacity and so you have to have a, a ruthless view of, of the world so if it doesn't meet one of those three objectives um, then you know you're you're not in a good place and mm -hmm. so when, whether it's going to be a vertical or a, a slice if you don't support one of those three things, you're looking vertical. Mm -hmm. It would be my answer to that mm -hmm. question. Okay, thanks. Admiral, and how about the, uh, yeah, fully agree. And the continuing resolutions are challenging. As we look back the last 10 years, about 40% of the time, Coast Guard has operated under, under a continuing resolution. And a lot of that is just by virtue of being uh, within DHS and just the challenges sometimes of getting those budgets across. But our, our number one watchword, again, relatively successful these last few years, but it's that readiness and to continue that, that upward trajectory to Commonot. Our Commonot talks a lot about three to 5% growth over the next few years. And we have to keep, we have to sustain that to get out of this readiness hole that we found ourselves in, the things we talked about earlier. So priorities are really recapitalizing the fleet. Bringing those offshore patrol cutters on board, they're about 360 feet, um, pretty capable asset, very similar to national security cutter. And then the polar security cutter. First time the nation has built a new icebreaker in over 40 years. That's a complicated asset to build, but we're committed to that. Programmer record is three there. Um, transitioning our 60 up to an all 60 fleet, uh, committed there. I mentioned infrastructure. And then the last thing I think we've all said is, how do you, when we talk readiness too, it's about the workforce. Can't do anything without people. So how do you recruit and retain the best uh, and the brightest out there to want to come in the Coast Guard, stay in the Coast Guard, and to keep executing our missions. Uh, so those are kind of the, the top priorities. Okay. I'm, I'm going to open up some questions here, but I remember something I learned from Admiral Daly and Admiral Blake was when you're balancing budgets, if you have a room full of people and I was sitting there at the table, it's like, if everyone's unhappy, then we must be finding a happy right. medium somewhere <laughs> in here, is that there's no one who's going to walk out of this room entirely right. happy. And the other reason I remember, too, is all Marine aviators are part Navy, so just remember that they all have wings on, and I talked about that in my retirement. You know, it was blue in support of green, but it's all naval aviation. So I want to go ahead and open up to the crowd up here. We've got about 13 minutes if people have some questions got a couple of microphones there's got to be someone you got budget officers lined up here this is an opportunity <laughs> of a lifetime now here comes somebody all right afternoon admirals general oh my this goodness is, Tate, Westbrook. Tate Westbrook oh my god with BAE systems <laughs> uh, questions primarily for the Pentagon but it certainly applies to DHS budget as well since I think we all acknowledge that a future fight with China is an inherent away game and therefore is a naval conflict. Curious to see if you are having any successes in convincing OSD and Congress to shift the balance of the budget slightly in the direction of the sea services. Great question. I don't know, Admiral, you want to start or the general? You know, I'll just jump in with a comment. You know, if you can read a map and read a newspaper, uh, the military decisions in a higher end fight will be decided on, above, and below the ocean, uh, influenced heavily from the littorals. It, so a 30-30, 30-10 construct by tradition of budgeting simply doesn't square with that, what I consider a military reality. Now, is there a shifting? I think there is, not only from across the river and, and an understanding that we want it to be an away game, we don't want it to be a home game, and that that away game will be led by the Naval Force and decided the military decision by a Naval Force. Okay, great. Admiral, you have anything to add on that or? Uh, I, I would uh, simply add that uh, you know, that seems to be the question of the day uh, each, um, pro you know, for a decade now and going forward. It's inherently a political question, both internal to the Pentagon and, and external to the Pentagon. So um, I think we're starting to see slight movement, uh, but, you know, measured uh, 
in you know um, in millions, maybe yeah, not billions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that matters. Um, so I would say we're moving glacially with that regard. Over. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Because I mean, the the the, the, the yeah. PRC has definitely moved their world into this lawfare. Coast Guard ships and all their hulls yeah. running around. Yeah. If a, bigger, a bigger Navy for them is almost their Coast Guard. Right, it is, and and I think so. As as we look at top lines of the budget, um, you know, our parent department will a lot of times kind of look at us, love the Coast Guard, but hey, for all those defense readiness missions that you do. Can the Navy or DOD pay for that? And I have to kind of push back and say, hey, they have their own top line pressures. We need to make, make, figure out a way to make this work. But in terms of we certainly need to be ready to fight tonight um, on that high end level. But I'd also say we need to compete with China where they are. And they're operating, if you look at that competition continuum across 180 degrees, they're operating everywhere, whether it's dubious legal claims to kind of expand their territory, um, using economic coercion, or checkbook diplomacy, kind of curry favor at the UN, or using their maritime militia and Coast Guard to intimidate their neighbors. Uh, they're doing all those things, and that's where the Coast Guard can add some value as we deploy, as Seventh Fleet kind of looks at us and says, hey, I can put the Coast Guard out there to do some things, whether it's with Taiwan or any of the other island nations out there, and those folks can, can relate to us a little bit better when they worry about their sovereignty protecting fisheries, that's a huge source of protein out there. Um, whether it's enforcement, migration, dealing with any time of maritime emergency, that's where we can provide value so that maybe we can free up our Navy and Marine Corps brethren to kind of just keep focusing on that high-end fight, but we're focusing on that other part of the competition continuum as well. Okay, that's great. Anybody else here? We got a couple of microphones. It's gotta be here. General, anyone else? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Brian Sadler from the Heritage Foundation. It's really for a question for the Pentagon. Uh, great seeing the Coast Guard here, as always. Uh, can you explain if you're seeing any unanticipated added costs with inflation, and how is that figuring into the drill that you're doing right now for the budget? Yeah, I'll uh, take a stab at that. <clears throat> so. Uh, Absolutely, uh, we are seeing inflation, and we're seeing that in terms of uh, whether it's just in, in executing our uh, the funds we have in 22. We're seeing uh, maintenance contracts come in uh, much higher than planned. Whether it's uh, in our mil military construction accounts for uh, building dry docks, we're seeing bids come in uh, across the board uh, higher uh, than planned, and so that is undoubtedly uh, happening. It's uh, Interesting to note, and I, I, I hope we have the 22 enacted, but will that actually make it into the 22 budget? So uh, Congress has the pen. Are they accounting for inflation? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to your 23 budget, that's all pre-decisional, so I, I won't opine there, but I think some thoughtful people in the administration are absolutely looking at inflation. Okay. All right, General, any, anything unique in inflation you're seeing in the Marine Corps? Um, not unique. Uh, you know, the three classes of inflation, whether it's pay, whether it's fuel, whether it's, as the Admiral said, uh, you know, purchase or non-pay, non-fuel, the numbers just don't square with our budget uh, accelerators. So will, it, will, we, will we get that sort of uh, attention when, when, the budget, uh, when the budget comes back? If not, you run into the you know, the classic lack of, buy, you know, descending buying power as you go, even if your top line goes up. Okay. Yes, sir. Sir, we have another question. This one's for you. It's uh, Secretary Harker. Um, it's a question on Red Hill. I know you've been spending a lot of time on that lately and a lot of the remediation with that challenge. Is there an acknowledgement on the part of OSD that resolving this in the long term is something that needs to be funded out of the fourth estate's share of the budget, or are they coming back to the Navy for that? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see. I, I don't see your face, but I can see uh, a little bit of you anyway. Uh, good to hear your voice. Um, so I, I would bend Red Hill into three categories. Uh, taking care of families today, uh, taking care of the state of Hawaii and the water and the aquifer, and then the third category, which is I think what you're touching on, which is you know, what is the future of Red Hill? Uh, that is absolutely, uh, OSD is all over that. And, and we ought to consider partnership because 
multiple COCOMs are concerned about that, uh, as is uh, the Secretary of Defense and others. So that's that's very much a uh, a, a, a joint issue, and therefore uh, correctly in the domain of OSD because of those factors. And whether it comes from fourth estate or uh, the services remains to be seen, but uh, but we're absolutely engaged with Congress and engaged uh, here in the building to making sure in the near term, we take care of those families and we take care of the, the water uh, issues there for the state of Hawaii. Thank you, Admiral, appreciate that. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was all the questions we have time for. Okay. Please welcome General Lawrence back to the stage. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, that was a tough discussion, and uh, and thank you for serving day and night, at least until Friday, as you take on these tough challenges. And I was watching Admiral Daly, and he's uh, he was just having this look of relief that he's not sitting in that building right now. Yeah. So thank you very, very much. On behalf of FCA International and the U.S. Naval Institute, we would like to present you with a token of our gratitude. Um, with the Naval Institute book, The Sailor Bookshelf by Admiral James Stravitas and uh, General Mahoney and, and Admiral Gumbleton, we will get the book to you uh, in the DC area. So thank you very much. And thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good to Thank you for all attending today's lunch. We're now moving into a dessert break on the exhibit hall. Taking a quick look at the rest of today's program, you'll see that we have one more panel session beginning at 2.30 over in Hall H. What capabilities are a priority for our numbered fleets today, and what is the next big thing we require to meet the future? Additionally, several sessions will be held throughout the remainder of the afternoon in the various exhibit hall theater spaces. From 3.45 to 5, there will be a networking reception sponsored by Akima, Aqua Security, Nokia, Taito Athene, and Vion. Additionally, drink tickets for that reception have been provided by Red River Technologies. Take advantage of this valuable network time visit exhibits, and network with other attendees and enjoy refreshments. Don't forget that from five, four, excuse me, 4 to 6 p.m., there will be an awards program and reception in Ballroom 20D. All are welcome to attend this program to recognize some incredible people who have done some extraordinary things for our nation. 